Christopher J. Moreau is my purposing company. So our business model is to identify generic drugs that have never been introduced into the U.S. or European market, uh, investigate them to see if they can treat other diseases. We start out by doing animal studies. Mm -hmm. If we find that the drug may have potential to treat another disease, we file new intellectual property and then we can quickly move the drug into human trials without having to redo all of the preclinical and phase one work. So it's a very capital efficient model to uh, identify new drugs to treat uh, diseases. Mm -hmm. um, and so recently you've received quite a bit of attention as a result of, the, of a drug <coughs> called Ifenprodil. <laughs> and I'm sure I screwed up that pronunciation. Ifenprodil, but you were close. Ifenprodil. And what is Ifenprodil demonstrating for you? Well, we, we've been investigating Ifenprodol for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. That is a disease of the lung where fibrosis occurs and it creates scarring. And uh, people have a terrible time breathing and uh, it's a very tough disease to have. You have about a three-year uh, life uh, once you're diagnosed. And we found that our drug is quite active in the lung. This is a bit technical, but it's affecting the NMDA receptor. And this is a receptor that's not only present in the brain, but also in lung tissue. Mm -hmm. And our chief science officer did the analysis and said, I wonder if this drug might also have some impact on, uh, on lung function. And uh, that was the motivation for us to do our animal studies for IPF. We've since investigated it for cough, chronic cough. And people don't tend to necessarily think about chronic cough as a big issue, but uh, that's persistent cough over eight weeks. Right now, Merck has a phase three drug called Gefapixent that they are advancing. Another Canadian company called Bellis is, has a phase two drug. It's about a billion dollar market. There is no drug for cough. It's being treated by lozenges and cough syrup and so on. And, uh, but it's quite a problem if you're coughing uh, past uh, post eight weeks and you can't stop it. it it's a life disruptor. So uh, we were moving our drug along into a phase two trial in Australia when last week, my CSO called me quite early in the morning. He said, are you up? I said, well, I've answered. And I'm known to be a, a guy at my, uh, my desk early. He said, um, I think Ifenprotol may be able to uh, treat coronavirus. And I said, how did you make that connection? And he said that he had just come across an, independ an independent study that was done in China where a group was uh, testing H5N1 infected mice. Now, mm. H5N1 is the avian bird flu. Uh, there have only been 500 cases recorded and it has a fatality rate of about 53 to 60 percent, so it's lethal. And in mice, Ifenprotol uh, improved survivability by 40 percent. It reduced acute lung injury, which is the result of the infection, and it also reduced inflammation in the lung tissue. So he said to me, if it works this well, in an animal model for H5N1, we might see similar response in the coronavirus in patients. So we made an announcement last week by news release that in fact we had discovered this paper. We let the market know that uh, we were thinking through how, what's our best next steps to actually let the, not let the world know, but see how, how we can in fact get this into a human trial quickly. Right. That's the benefit of a repurposed drug. It's already safe. Sure, we it's already know all of its side effects, all of its... That's right. This drug has been developed in the 1970s by Sanofi, mm -hmm. and it's treating neurological conditions in Japan. So vertigo, depression, it's been investigated for alcohol addiction. Hmm. And um, there are two very, just quickly, two very successful repurposing stories. One of them is a drug called Tecfedera. This was a post-World War II drug in Germany developed for psoriasis. People that were taking the drug that had MS were telling their physicians that their symptoms were being alleviated. Enough of uh, the patients uh, reported that that they investigated it, and now it is a billion dollar drug for Biogen, Tecfedera. The second example is thalidomide. This was a drug developed in the early 60s for women who had pre uh, nausea, mor morning sickness, and it caused terrible birth defects. But of late, the last few years it's been investigated as an anti-tumor uh, drug for cancer and it's a billion dollar drug for cell gene so we're following that same path finding older safe drugs and seeing if we can find new uses for them and and now we can move them move them quite quickly into human trials mm -hmm. okay so if 
the uh, drug is effective in the upper lungs for remediation of these conditions caused by the coronavirus, COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, is there an expectation that that it might have an antiviral element to it as well? It, uh, it would be really fantastic if it did. Uh, we, we are sort of exploring right now, uh, we're considering this as a cytoprotective drug. So it's obviously protecting the lung cells. Uh, does it have an antiviral effect? We don't know yet. It's something that we're thinking about just because of the urgency uh, that uh, having access to a coronavirus assay, they've isolated the virus, and we could very quickly, uh, by exposing the virus to our drug, Ifenprotol, we could find out if it has an antiviral effect, and that would be mm -hmm. very helpful as well. Was there any mention of an antiviral effect in the tests of the H5N1 application? No, and, and, and um, they, they were specifically just looking at the results. But what, what's sort of interesting, and I want to mention this, is how the Chinese came to identify Ifenprotol. And the analogy I'd like to uh, use is that uh, our chief scientist identified the drug by research. He read papers about the drug, its target mechanism of action, how it worked. The Chinese took lung cells and they did what's known as a gene, a gene knockout. So they knocked out of the cells about 19,000 genes. They exposed the cells to H5N1. They took the lung cells that survived and they looked at the genes that were affected. What genes were protecting the cells? They then screened 60 drugs to find out what drugs affected the genes that protected the cells, and Ifenprotol was number one. Hmm. Then they ran their animal study for H5N1. So the, to, to give the analogy, my CSO picked out somebody from a crowd from their description. They picked that person out with DNA. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the process. So that's what emboldened us when we saw that data to really start moving forward. And as you know, this morning we announced that we had submitted um, a package to the FDA to talk about uh, moving forward very quickly into human trials. Fascinating. So how soon until we see data that would give us an indication of its antiviral activity, if any, or B, its efficacy for COVID-19 related lung damage? You know, we, we, the, the challenge on the viral part is we have to have access to coronavirus. And so we would need to be working through laboratories that have isolated it. So I can't give you an answer on that. Okay. We're thinking it through. Right. Knowing it's antiviral will be helpful. But more importantly right now is that uh, we're working on getting it into patients. Mm -hmm. Because um, if it's antiviral, it'll just con it, it will help be more efficacious. Sure. But that won't make the decision should we tr test it in patients. We okay. think we have enough data. It's a safe drug. We have strong data for IPF, chronic cough, H5N1. And by the way, you can't test people for H5N1. Right. It's unethical. It's too deadly. So you can go from an animal trial into an approval. So we have very powerful data. It's H5N1. And now that to us is, and the safety of the drug, we think that that should convince regulators and physicians to work with us to try to test it in people. You bet. Okay, let's assume best case scenario. Uh, Ifenprotol is found to be very effective and suddenly everybody in the world who's affected currently 138,000 cases, mm -hmm. everybody would like to get some. How difficult is it to produce? How expensive is it to produce? How much is it going to cost the end user to access? So our business model was to start synthesis of the drug into our own formulation. So we have begun that process and we're formulating for IV intravenous because some people who are ill may not be able to take a pill mm -hmm. and we're also formulating for once a day. The current generic supply in Japan is uh, three times a day so it's a 20 milligram pill. Um, we, our, our manufacturers are saying that they can have API that's the active pharmaceutical ingredient within three months and uh, depending on what the feedback is from the FDA and how much additional tox work, toxicity work they'd like to see, we think we could scale up if needed based on the data um, in, a, in a reasonable time period. We're talking probably six months where we could start having what's known as finished product, the API, and is this an, either an IV or is it a finished pill um, so that uh, people could start to access it. But it would be in 
in comparative speaking to how a drug usually has to go through preclinical phase one and so on, sure. this would be dramatically faster. So theoretically, and forward-looking statements and safe harbor language all in <laughs> front of this question, uh, it's conceivable that this could be the leading treatment for COVID-19, all things resulting positively from the tests and the FDA processes. I'll, I'll, I'm going to qualify my statement by saying right now we only have animal data that it worked in H5N1. We have our own data, and that was an independent study. We have our own data that it worked in IPF and chronic cough. So we don't have any human data that we have been able to access that it would work. We're hopeful it will. It's, it, what's interesting about the drug is that it could be a, 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 an additional therapy. We haven't seen any contraindications with the drug. So it could be added to other uh, drugs, other therapies. And that's what's interesting about it. Uh, there, uh, this drug seems to be very well tolerated, and so it could be one of. Right. We certainly hope it's therapeutic. Um, it could be protective of the lung as well, which would open up different implications where it could stop somebody from advancing into a more serious lung injury. It, we, we've seen its antifibrotic performance. And just to be specific, when we did our IPF animal study, we went up against the two leading IPF drugs in the world, natinanib and profinidome, Roche and Boehringer. And our drug, I, I, Ifenprotol, outperformed both by 40% and 20%. So we had a greater reduction in scarring in our animal model. And scarring is the result of a viral infection in the lung. Mm -hmm. So you could survive a serious case of corona, but now you've got some serious lung conditions you're dealing with with the rest of your life. And our drug could be helpful in, in reducing that scarring. So there's many exciting and, and we're quite hopeful and we, we think it's uh, because of its safety that we should have an opportunity to work with regulators and physicians to get it tested. Fascinating. Well, we'll be following closely. Thanks very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me.